Well, how's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well and catching all the sessions today. Some really good ones I've seen so far. Um, so my name is Mickey Dietrich. I'm the River Area Council of Government Municipal Management Consultant um, for the New York State Tug Hill Commission. And we actually uh, work with municipalities in the Tug Hill region. There's over 50 uh, villages and towns that we uh, work with providing technical assistance to. I was also a past president of the New York State GS Association also. So been doing this for a little while. Um, you'll see my contact information there. Feel free to contact me with more detailed questions uh, later since we'll kind of be going through this kind of quick. Uh, so quick, quickly some talking points that I'm gonna go over is just a quick history. Uh, the advantages that QGIS offered, uh, the system design uh, that we put together and some helpful tips and then kind of a quick recap and then any questions. So on the history, so uh, we started off with Esri. I started in Tug Hill Commission in 2002. And at that point in time, you know, we had, you know, the ARC editor licenses. So we had two ARC editor licenses, which was kind of the middle of the road licensing. And uh, we had two spatial analyst license, one 3D analyst license, one ARC pad. And then we had ARC IMS and ARC SDE for our online map viewer that we started around 2007, and as well as our enterprise database. Uh, one of the things that we were faced with was we had, we got to the point where we had over $9,000 per year in, in yearly maintenance that we were paying out. And for a smaller organization like us, um, we actually, uh, you know, our, our computer budget was maybe only about 12,000 per year. So that eats up quite a bit of your computer budget pretty quickly just on the software maintenance there. So, so anyways, then, uh, we started looking into some different options and what might be out there. So this is like just a quick thing from Google Trend showing the QGIS uh, search, how often it gets searched and stuff here. And you can see that it's trending upward here um, in the United States since 2004. So the, you know the commission started looking at alternative GIS solutions right around uh, late 2011, early 2012. And, um, and we looked at different options like Manifold GIS, Map Windows GIS, and QGIS. And we ended up deciding to go forward with the QGIS because it seemed to offer uh, more of the tools that we needed to do. And, um, and I'll kind of run into some of that reasoning here shortly. So we chose you know, QGIS to be our desktop program. And you know, the main reason is kind of being open source, of course, it's free. But as well as being open source, sometimes you know you, you don't get the updates that you need with open source. So QGIS, I noticed that they're consistently putting out updates. And also there's a growing user community starting to form. I mean, you could Google and find videos for help. Uh, there's also the forums that you could utilize. So a sense that there was good support for the program. The other thing we have is uh, with a spatial analyst with the two extensions that we were paying for through Esri, QGIS actually included a lot of that functionality already that we needed for our spatial analyst capabilities. So that was another reason that we were looking at that and go, wow, you know, that's, that's really good. As well as it provided other features with like doing vector data and things like that, that we would have had to pay for like an ARC info license for, but we could do it in QGIS um, at no cost. So, you know, those are some of the reasons. The other thing is there was just a lot of plugins, which offered a lot of ability to do, uh, have more capabilities to do different things. Um, the other th big thing too that we found was like an art map when we're doing a, our uh, layouts and stuff, when you're handling transparent images, it usually put a big black box around it. It couldn't handle the ping images and stuff. So with QGIS, it could handle the transparent images and when it put that big black box around there. The other thing it offered was just flexibility in general, the ability to work with different like database programs too. Um, was key to us, you know, choosing to move forward with QGIS. So, so then COVID-19 happened. And during that, I think that just reaffirmed to us that we, the, the system that we put together uh, ended up to be the right system for us because we all had to start working from home. And in that we are, our system was set up to do that to purpose for remote access. And with QGIS, um, you know, a lot of our staff are able to download it at home. 
onto their machines and get access to our data as project files and stuff because they're all pointed to a centralized database. So, uh, like I said, when the COVID-19 thing happened, that kind of just re to us that we were headed down the right path with QGIS and actually I had other organizations asking me how could they set up the QGIS so they could give some people in their staff access to data because they couldn't uh, provide them with the licensing the ESRI licensing that they had so you know from that standpoint you know it offered that flexibility that we were looking for and that was needed during that time of the COVID-19 here so so came, then came the QGIS system design. Yes, the tireless process of designing the system and trying to get everything to work. And, and you do a lot of research in that process. And, you know, we, we looked at many different aspects during that point, you know, what was gonna work. We wanted it to handle an emergency, just like COVID-19. We wanted it flexible enough to where we could easily uh, duplicate that in another setting. So there was a lot involved with our uh, design process, which we looked at a centralized database. So what we use is a PostgreSQL, and uh, that was hosted on an Amazon Web Service. And then, you know, then the PostGIS is that uh, GIS component that's added to a PostgreSQL database. So that's what we uh, decided on for our centralized database. And what we wanted with a centralized database is to have all of our data in one spot that would feed like QGIS, would feed our online map viewer, and also feed the mobile data collecting we would have out in the field going on. And we wanted to see all that data coming in kind of real time into a centralized location. So then the next part, and it, you know, just, I guess one step back is that, you know, with that database, we chose post GIS, but that's a decision that each organization needs to make, you know, what database program if you're looking to use a database works best for you and then build around that i think is key so then we have the online map viewing so we decided to choose gs cloud primarily because gs cloud offered more flexibility with its licensing for doing like private map viewing and uh, map portals and data collecting and uh, and so that was one of the reasons we chose that as well as this program was built off from post GIS database also, which once again, kind of falls back to our centralized database being that and being able to feed our QGIS desktop program that we're using in the office for our work. So that all seemed to tie in pretty good together. And they've been pretty good to work with during that process. So then we looked at the third part of this was the mobile data collecting. So we wanna make sure everything was seamless again we had the GS Cloud mobile data collecting app that we could utilize. And that's kind of what we kind of decided upon using. Once again, we could go out in the field, collect our data out in the field, and immediately once we sent that data, it went right up into our post GS database on Amazon Web Services, which means if I'm back in the office and I was doing something on QGS, I could refresh and also there would be the data that's newly coming in, or I could go to our online map viewer and see that data popping up basically almost real time once it gets sent. So that's another reason we chose that route. Um, the other thing we did choose is we chose a Bluetooth GPS receiver. In this case, we went with the EOS positioning systems. That's a pretty high accuracy uh, Bluetooth GPS receiver. We didn't want to be cumbersome with GPS units that had their own program because it took a lot more training and effort from our end to try to train people to use those. Whereas if you have a smartphone or tablet, that's a lot easier. So we just Bluetooth the GPS into a smartphone or tablet to do the data collecting. This is an example of what you'd see on your phone for the data collecting. On the left would be a form that you create. This is pretty plain, but you can you know, make it with all the bells and whistles you want. So we created the form to collect the data and you'll see in the center picture, there's a green dot there, which shows a park that is collected. We're collecting community resources in an area. And over on the right, you'll see the information that got entered. And also there's even the capability to collect photos and have those tagged to the points as well as audio even too. So, you know, that kind of appealed to us. So you can see on the right hand side, that is all the information that was filled in there. And then in the online map viewer, after that point gets collected, it goes into the online map viewer immediately. So now you can go in there, click on the point, pull up the information that you see in the center there. And then on the right, you see the photo. You can view the photo in the online map viewer. And all this kind of happens almost immediately. We had interns one time out collecting fire hydrants. And while they're out collecting fire hydrants, 
I asked them to collect pictures and I could see the points popping up on the screen. I clicked on it and I said, wait, there's no photos. So I sent a text message and almost immediately, only a few minutes after that, also I see the photos all starting to come in on the points because they got the message. So now it also feeds, so the centralized database also feeds the QGIS. So here's QGIS and it has all the information there. So you can click on it there and it has the name, the monument park, categories park and so forth in there. So you start to see how this whole system uh, works together here. And this is a design of the whole system here, just kind of schematic. So there's a centralized database. It's almost like a three-legged stool, if you want to think about it that way. The centralized database, in which in this case we chose the PostGIS, PostgreSQL one, is kind of our centralized database. That's the seat of the stool, and you got the three legs that support it. So we got our desktop program, which our staff uses for creating maps and editing data. Then we got our online map viewer that a lot of our local governments that we work with might go in and view the data as well as it faces to the public so the public can view information. And then we got the mobile data collecting, which in a lot of cases, the mobile data collecting is actually for our communities. They go around and they might map out, you know, um, signs, lighting, water or sewer infrastructure, as well as recreational trails. So. So all that information that they enter immediately goes into our centralized database and makes it so they can view it on in the map viewer or some of our communities actually download QGIS and are getting more involved with using QGIS, which is another reason we went with QGIS is because that's something that doesn't cost the communities anything. They're reluctant to spend money originally on something like Esri products. And we said, well, if we're gonna have them using QGIS, we should be using it too. So um, we're not trying to trained in different areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then uh, a few like just helpful tips I found. Uh, there's a lot more that went into this. I'd be happy to talk more on those later. But one of the plugins I felt was important to mention is this Quick Map Services plugin for QGIS. Uh, this gives you uh, ability to download different base maps. So right here, it usually loads underneath the web menu there. You'll see Quick Map Services. You usually get a portion of what you see there for all the different base map layers. But if you go to the About button way down at the bottom, bottom there and click on that, there's actually an ability to activate um, another feature that gives you all the rest of these base maps as part of that. The other one uh, plugin we tend to use is the MMQGIS, which we use a bit for like geocoding and doing that type of thing. So um, that's also, a, a, it provides some added functionality that may not be there in other plugins. So um, that was another reason for wanting to kind of just show you that. That's a good one to have. So those are kind of like two main ones right now that we usually have. Uh, the GS Cloud Publisher plugin is something new i know they're going to be doing a presentation on it in, in one of the following conference days here um and that's something new that kind of came out where you can create a qgis map and push that up into a gis cloud online map with all the same symbology and everything so so that's uh i haven't gotten into a whole lot with that because we already have our maps pretty well created at this point but i just want to make mention that that would make things a lot easier for us the other thing I wanted to point out was I, I know you probably heard some about the personal geo databases and, and one of the previous talks. So we actually try to use in the, um, the open up the personal geo database uh, using like the file um, database uh, option there in QGIS and we had issues with it. And actually I found this article, so I just tagged it in there. Uh, once I loaded, that uh, Microsoft Access ODBC driver, then it worked fine. I was actually able to open up the personal geo databases because a lot of our data was in personal geo databases beforehand. So this allowed me to access that data and make that so I could import it into the post GIS. So I just want to make mention of that because that one, I banged my head against the wall a few times trying to get that to work. And then like I was already presented earlier is the Slayer uh, plugin that I know it'll be coming here and um, where you can convert MXDs into QGIS projects, which I have to say that that's probably one of the biggest things for us right now is checking every single MXD file that we had in Esri to make sure we got all the data we need that we're loaded into post GIS, as well as recreating those maps of QGIS 
which is pretty time consuming. So I, that is one of the things that the Slayer uh, plugin definitely would help out a lot with um, because that has been one of our biggest hurdles in our transition. I just wanted to mention uh, quickly the DB manager. So in QGIS, it automatically has a DB manager in the menu bar there. And that's where we use to import our data into like the post GIS. And you can see there's other database listed there like Oracle Spatial and Spatial Light. Um, so that's the program, like I said, we, we use to pretty much create new uh, schemas in our database to load data and also import the data in. Uh, for post GIS, if you're going to use something like that with QGIS, or um, when when we use Amazon Web Services, this is one of the things that got us hung up early on too, as we we're trying to get this. Is I could start the PostgreSQL database, but I couldn't uh, load the GIS data into it. I was having issues. This article walks you through um, some of the things that you need to do to activate the post GIS extension in order to make that PostgreSQL database work with GIS data. So that, I located the links at the bottom there too that would take you to this thing. And this is what I used to get it. In all honesty, to set up a PostGIS and Amazon Web Services probably only take about 10, 15 minutes at that. Um, it really doesn't take that long, but this slowed me down a little bit in the beginning. So I wanted to show that too. And then also with PostGIS, you have another program you need called PG Admin, which that basically goes and that helps you set up your users, what kind of privileges they have to the data. So it kind of helps maintain your, your database. So, and that's a free program too. It goes along with it um, that you need to have loaded. A uh, quick thing with the GS Cloud, if you did go to this route, you know, I just wanted to make this available to you, but this is something that really prevented, at first we couldn't collect any data in the mobile data collecting app that we had where it was already existing data in the PostGIS database. It, it wouldn't allow us to collect anything and add to it. And this is why, basically, you have to have a field in there called OGC underscore FID, and it needs to be the, set as a primary key. So this is all done in that PG admin program. So you, you get to learn a little bit of SQL in the process. Um, but you know that was a key key thing for me to get over a hump there in the process and, and, and be able to move forward. So I wanted to share that with you there. Uh, and also the data naming in GS Cloud. So when GS Cloud brings data into the platform from a post GS database, I have to tag it like T Denmark zoning you see towards the top and T Floyd zoning towards the bottom. If I didn't tag it like that, you'd see like several zonings and you wouldn't know which one belonged to what community. So it's important no matter what program you use or what database you use, you kind of understand how they view data or display data. So you can set up your QGIS application the same way or, or the data coming into it kind of the same way um, with a certain schema. And I'm just gonna make a quick uh, reference to the graphics. There's an open source image editor called GIMP, which I do a bit with editing um, in QGIS and that's one of the programs I use. And a quick recap uh, before questions is just that, you know, we use QGIS, which was free. Um, but I have to say it's one of the most powerful tools I've seen um, for GIS. And then the PostgreSQL with the PostGIS is free, the program itself. For hosting it, we pay Amazon Web Services. We were probably around 400 per year, but we upped our database size. So we're about 700 per year. And the GS Cloud, we have a map portal as well as editor licensing, mobile data collecting licensing and all that. And that's roughly right around 1200 per year. So overall, our savings right now from where we were is almost about $7,100 per year we're saving. So that's pretty big for our small organization. And with that, I'll take any questions except where the fishing hotspots are that I have. All right, well, thank you very much, Mickey. Um, we do have a couple questions on the chat. One question was, do you have any suggestions regarding whether some sort of uh, redundancy within the main database is necessary? In the post GIS database, I'm taking it? 
I'm assuming so. Yeah. I mean, right now we, we don't have any, uh, the, the amount of data that we're collecting and stuff, we can pretty much make sure that there, we're not, you know, somebody's not editing in the same database at the same time. Um, we do actually, Amazon Web Services does provide, you know, automatic backups and stuff to it. Um, but yeah, we haven't really had to worry too much at this point, just because of the amount of users we have, we pretty much know who's out collecting and, and where and what part of that database they're collecting in. Right, and I imagine the answer to that question really depends on the, the situation, the scale and number of concurrent users and so forth. Yes. Um, you gave us some figures about the um, the costs that you're paying now for your setup. Do you want to compare that to what your previous setup was with uh, your former products? Yeah, so like I, I think I showed that quick thing, but we have about, we're saving over $7,000. Basically, the QGS is free. Uh, we pay for the Amazon Web Services and we pay for GS Cloud. So we're, you know, we're paying about 1900 per year right now, whereas before we were paying over $9,000. Uh, another question here. Uh, I use Arc Collector currently to collect distribution pull data. Uh, we use tables out in the field uh, with drop down menus that fill an Excel file once exported. Um, would Cloud GIS be a good equivalent program? Yeah, you can kick uh, files out to a spreadsheet. Uh, format in GS Cloud. Um, like I said, we our primary purpose with the GS Cloud mobile data collecting app is that we want the data going directly into the post GIS. So that's primarily what we've used used it for. But I do know there is an option to kick it out as a as a table. And uh, Kurt Menke also answered in the chat already, but um, we do have some upcoming sessions uh, actually next week and the 31st as well. Um, so the next two Fridays we'll be here and uh, various people are talking about collection uh, in the field. Yep. Um, checking the time, we should have time for one more maybe. Um, do you also update other maps online such as OpenStreetMap? Are you involved with that at all? No, we haven't. We Our hands are pretty full. We're not a big organization, so we're pretty full right now just keeping up with our own system <laughs> and trying to get that because we're still transitioning from the Esri stuff over to uh, QGIS. It's been a long process. I mean, we've had thousands of map projects to go through <laughs> and lots of data. So, <laughs> so no, we, we basically have just only been working with uh, with what we have for our system. <laughs> 